Washington, Washington D.C. Wow. So, welcome, welcome to the uh, Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, uh, ARCUS, uh, where Arctic research is connected since 1988. Uh, my name is Bob Rich. I'm the executive director, and thank you so much for coming for our seventh Arctic Research Seminar Series presentation here in D.C. ARCUS has been working uh, to connect Arctic research across boundaries through communication, coordination, and collaboration. We're a nonprofit consortium of organizations and individuals interested in advancing inquiry, discovery, and understanding of this important region and informing sound decision making. The seminar series is designed to provide unique access to some of the leading Arctic researchers for federal officials, members of the DC policy community, and the broader public interested in the changing Arctic. The ideas shared here represent the cutting edge of what we're exploring and learning up north, and also what it means for the US and the rest of the world. For those of you in the room here, I encourage you to take a look at the ARCUS materials on the table outside on your way out. Um, you should have received a, a seminar evaluation, which we'd really like you to return to the registration desk um, so that uh, we can uh, improve these seminars in the future. If you're online, you'll have an opportunity to fill out an evaluation at the conclusion of the program, and I would definitely encourage you to do so. We'd really love to hear what you think. For those of you on Twitter, we are encouraging you to use the hashtag, uh, hashtag Arcus webinar uh, down in the bottom right of your screen um, and please use that to discuss the event and we're currently joined by uh, I don't know 60 it looks like participants online uh, from all over so thanks for coming my uh, colleagues are available online to answer any questions that you might have about Arcus or Arctic research and to forward us any questions you have for George here in DC so you'll have an opportunity to submit text questions throughout the entire webinar so feel free um, and uh, type your questions in the chat pane and we will uh, try to address them at the conclusion of George's presentation. Whether you're here or online, we would like to invite everybody to become a member of ARCUS. You're eligible, you and your organization are eligible, um, including uh, academic institutions, government agencies, corporations, and indigenous organizations. Uh, um, you can join at our website at www.arcus.org. So, I'd also like to acknowledge our partners in this seminar series. I'd like to thank the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which enables us to use this excellent meeting space. And thanks to the Polar Research Board at the National Academies of Sciences, uh, which is uh, assisting us with our uh, check-in on site here. And of course, I want to thank the National Science Foundation's Division of Polar Programs for major financial support to ARCUS and to supporting this seminar series. Now, let me briefly introduce our speaker. Uh, George Savoki has uh, studied seabirds in the Arctic Alaska since 1970, and he's participated in studies and assessments related to oil and gas development and regional climate change. Since 1975, he's maintained a continuing study every year of black guillemots on Cooper Island, and, uh, which is off the coast of Alaska in the western Beaufort Sea. And this study is one of the longest longitudinal bird studies in the Arctic, and its findings have consequences for all sorts of environmental factors, which I'll let uh, George tell you about. I'm really delighted to, uh, to have George here speaking in this seminar series to tell us about, about the birds, but also about how the birds are making a difference in our world. So without any uh, further ado, let me introduce George. His presentation today is entitled, 40 Years of Change, A Seabird Response to Melting Arctic. Please join me in welcoming to the Arcus TC seminar series, George Devoki. very much, Bob. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here uh, for a number of reasons, and it is true I've been a seabird biologist now for more than 40 years, um, but I am talking about the Arctic today more than seabirds. Um, the, the, the number of people who care about the species I study, the black guillemot, there's probably six people in the world. <laughs> uh, two of them don't like me, and I doubt the data from the other people. Uh, but the people who care about the Arctic and what we're seeing in the Arctic and the consequences uh, of what's going on there is very, very large uh, and ultimately should involve the whole world because of the implications of what we're seeing. Um, I have been studying uh, black guillemots for 40 years um, uh, up, up in the Arctic and actually I just finished my 42nd summer and I'm going to be talking to you about uh, observations I've made off the tip of uh, Point Barrow, Alaska. Um, during that period of time. But my story actually starts here in Washington, D.C. In 1970, I was a pre-doctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Institution. And even though I lived in a cabin like this for the past now 15 years or so, 
uh, I was in the Museum of Natural History when the Coast Guard called and said, is there anyone who would like to go up to the Arctic on an icebreaker this summer? So I was 24 years old, and of course they said, Sh <laughs> sure. Um, which are, you, and you have to be careful what you say sure to when you're in your early 20s, as many <laughs> know. And the reason that they wanted to go up there, uh, that they wanted to have a cruise, is that uh, Prudhoe Bay, uh, that there had been an oil find in Prudhoe Bay in 1968. Uh, this was going to change the whole energy structure of the U.S. But when they were going to build the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, uh, and uh, they, this was just a few months after, actually it was even prior in 69, prior to Earth Day happening, a whole range of environmental laws were coming in, and they realized we just can't build that as quickly as, as, as we thought. It's going to take some time, and various groups were stopping the building of that. So they said, let's see if we can take a super tanker to the Northwest Passage uh, to bring back oil. And the Coast Guard was very concerned about that, and they wanted to have a cruise there, a cruise offshore, because no one knew anything about the Beaufort Sea, which is the area uh, east, of, east of Point Barrow um, in, the, in, in the Arctic Ocean. So, so I was lucky enough to go on cruises, uh, the Western Beaufort Sea Ecological Cruises, in 1972, or 1970 through 72. And one of the things I did in 72 in the summer was see what birds were breeding on the barrier islands that are found on the north slope of Alaska. They're, they're, one, one doesn't have the classical rocky cliff that you have in the southern part of the state, uh, up in the Chukchi, uh, northern Chukchi and in the Beaufort Seas. You have these flat barrier islands, but they are not bad places for surface nesting birds to breed. So I was taken into these islands by the Coast Guard helicopters uh, operating from the icebreaker, walked from one end of the island to the other, wrote down what was there, and it was great Lewis and Clark type natural history. It was saying, okay, no one's been here before, what's actually breeding on these islands? And there was things like arctic terns uh, that use the, use the wood for protection from the wind and also camouflage and things like that, or saving skulls. And I was writing down the, the number of eggs, the number of nests, state, state of development, but then things changed when I went uh, to Cooper Island, which was uh, which is around 25 miles, around 30 kilometers uh, uh, east of Point Barrow, Alaska. And in '72, when I first went there, it was just another island among many islands. I had no idea I was about to start a very long-term relationship with this island. Um, and it, it is also 25 miles uh, east of Barrow, Alaska. Now, in the past month, uh, the the, the city of Barrow has changed its name from Barrow to the original Lickyabek. Uh, some of my slides here may say Barrow. Uh, I have many friends in Barrow who have helped me run this study to a great extent because I, they have been able to take me out by boat and things like that. And the next thing they have to help me with is to show me how to pronounce Lickyabek uh, <laughs> correctly. But uh, Cooper Island, which was named by the British uh, when they uh, claimed it for the crown in, uh, in the in the in the 1800s, uh, or known as Igloroc, and that name may change too in the future, is a sand and gravel bar, uh, just like many, and I was dropped at one end. And what really surprised me is as I was walking down the island, I found a, a, a very large amount of cut wood and boxes and floorboards, and it turns out that the Navy had been out there in 1955, 56, and as was typical for the military leaving a site like that, all they did was just leave and blow things up because they had a bunch of ordnance. So they just blew things up. But there was all this trash on the island, um, which, you know, initially looks like an eyesore. But then I saw that, okay, there is a cavity nesting seabird, the black guillemot, that is right next to these, to these uh, things that the Navy has left. And I turned over a box uh, in 1972 and found this pair of uh, guillemots breeding there. It was the first record for them breeding in the Beaufort Sea. And it was a real seabird. It it's, it's, it's in the family with, with myrrhs and puffins. And this was very exciting to me. It was, one, it was a range change, and it was also a very interesting use of kind of this, these things that had been left there. And guillemots are known to be very plastic in their, in their choice of uh, nest sites. Anything that has an overhead cover will do. And so I saw that on my first visit in, in, uh, in late June, early, early July. I turned over some boxes, and when I went back in August, found that Guillemots had adopted some of these sites that I had created. Uh, so like I had actually, at the edge of the Arctic Ocean, created nest sites for a very interesting Arctic seabird. And it was a really, it was a, it was a very powerful hit that I'm still possibly operating off of. But for anyone who's ever put out a, a 
birdhouse or even a bird feeder, and then you get a connection with the birds that's different than it is when you're just walking through the woods and seeing them, I now had this connection that, okay, this is what's going on. So, so that, was, um, that was how I first became introduced to Mance Black Guillemot. And I, I use the subspecies name because it is uh, a high Arctic subspecies of a species that's found in Great Britain on the coast of Maine. This is a different uh, subspecies, as I'll tell you about in a minute. But what was really interesting about this ground colony is this is your typical black guillemot colony. And this is a nice, a very nice Scottish black guillemot colony. Birds would be breeding in places like uh, in, in, the, in, in the scree, in the talus at the base of these cliffs, or maybe even up in, um, in openings up in, the, up in the higher cliff areas. Whereas, whereas my black guillemot, so you look like this. It isn't half as picturesque, but it's very functional in that seabirds try to breed places where terrestrial predators and any predators don't have easy access to them, which is why they breed in the rock rubble and up on the cliffs. But here they were breeding on a flat surface um, in easily accessible nest sites. Now, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio originally. I was born in a glaciated uh, lake bed, and there's not much vertical relief. I didn't, see, I didn't have much kind of a vertical relief until much later in my life. And I have friends who work in places like these cliffs and go over the edge on ropes and things like that. I tell my son we come from a long line of people who didn't go over the edge of cliffs unless we were forced to, <laughs> uh, even though we were very, might be very curious about seabirds. And also, uh, to the extent that I may have, and most researchers may have, a minor amount of ADD, if you go to a big colony, a classic seabird colony like this, what do you study? I mean, which, which pair of birds do you pick out of that, out of that group there to, 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 to look at? And also, what you find from that pair, will, will it be represented? So Cooper Island provided a place that was flat, that had easy access, and also I could check every nest every day if I wanted to. And that, that, that was very unique. Um, so uh, I didn't think I'd be going back uh, after having created these sites in 72. Um, but then there was the Arab oil embargo in the early 70s. And uh, they said, we have to be less dependent on foreign oil. We're going to be drilling offshore in, in uh, throughout Alaska. And the Outer Continental Shelf um, Environmental Assessment Program started. And I got a grant to, or a contract, to study birds at the ice edge in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas, and, and also the Bering. When I asked the Coast Guard what icebreakers they were going to have going up in 1975, they said, we don't have any. Um, so I said, OK. They said, well, isn't there something you can do? And I thought, well, you know, I've been to Cooper Island, and I know that the ice is just offshore, and I know that the ice is, is right also very close to shore, so I can go there for the summer and see what happens, because I will be at the ice edge, even though the icebreaker couldn't take me to the ice edge. So we went up there and mainly studied a colony of terns, so 75 pairs of terns. But while we were there, we started building nest sites, because we knew that guillemots would adopt them. And the guillemots uh, responded very rapidly uh, and got to, the, uh, got to form the largest black guillemot colony in the state of Alaska. So I was doing this at the time. There's nothing inherently good about having more black guillemots in the world. Uh, I was doing this so I could get a sample size that when I was studying all the things that you studied, such as age at first breeding, mate and site fidelity, breeding success, growth rates, hatching and fledging success, that I would have a sample size that would say something that was, that was more than, than the 10 pairs I found there in the, it, in the 1970s. The other really nice thing about the guillemots is that you can catch them and hold them and weigh them and measure them and ban them. Um, they, Unlike many seabirds, which if you do this, they will go offshore and mope for the next two months because you violated their personal space. Uh, guillemots, if you toss them up in the air like this, frequently go right back to their nest site. Um, and so they were, they were species that I could, I could handle and, and banned. So I banded all the chicks and have banded all the chicks that have fledged from the island since 1975 and have banded uh, early on roughly 90% of the adults. And now we have 100% of all the adults banded. So we knew all the birds on the island knew them personally. I had a 32-year-old female black guillemot who died recently. It was the longest relationship I had other than my current one in Seattle. So, <laughs> uh, so, so it, is, it, was, it was a species that allowed you to do this. And also, if you're looking at changes in the environment, it lets you control by individual, which is, which is huge, of course, by individual and age or breeding experience. Because if you're saying that the environment's doing something, it helps very much if you're able to say, but in the past, this bird of a known age and no experience with doing this. So one of the things about man's black guillemot I didn't know until the mid-90s, I collected blood for someone doing genetic studies uh, out of Queen's University in, uh, um, in, 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 in Canada. 
And what they found is that the birds on Cooper had a bottleneck around 15,000 years ago during the last glacial maximum, and they were apparently isolated to a part of the Arctic Basin that was, that was not glaciated, but certainly had sea ice, but probably very small cracks in the sea ice where birds could get in and get, and, and get prey. So, so basically, uh, th this is one of the few truly Arctic species in that most birds that breed in the Arctic go well south in the, in the, in the summer, or rather in the, in, the, in the winter when they aren't there. Guillemots were adapted 15,000 years ago to occupy this unglaciated area of the, of the, of the Arctic Basin. And um, what that means is that they are essentially a Pleistocene relic, uh, similar, similar to the woolly mammoth, adapted to an environment that existed during the last glacial maximum when, 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 when ice and snow were king, and they're now having to cope with the fact that ice and snow are melting. And that's something we didn't know until um, actually well, almost, almost 20 years into the study, and it changed our whole view of it. Okay, yes, now we know what we're studying. Now we know what the, sub, what the species is or what the subspecies is. Now, if you're in the Arctic and having to feed there through small cracks in the ice, and you are a fish feeder, you have to feed on Arctic cod. There is, a, there is an ice-adapted system uh, that exists with zooplankton and Arctic cod right under the ice. And this is very important in the Arctic because unlike the subarctic where you get a great deal of mixing, um, you don't get the mixing, or typically up until recently, you, you didn't get the mixing because the ice was forming a cap and stopping much of the wind mixing. Um, you also had, in nearshore waters, you had the ice scouring the nearshore so that the kelp and other things that you get uh, on, the, on, on the bottom couldn't, couldn't, couldn't form. And all you really had was this ice-adapted uh, fish species, the Arctic cod, which also can be found at depth if the water is cold enough. And Arctic cod are found between minus 2C and plus 2C. That's the range they like. If it gets up higher than 4C, they, uh, they, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't like it. And they are found directly uh, in the ice. People who I've talked to who are divers say it's like a coral reef. You see them kind of hiding in places like this. And guillemots will go under the ice and pick these guys up. So um, one of the quotes I found, and I can't actually find a source of this, but I found this probably now almost 20 years ago when climate change was first coming in, is the species that have critical life history st uh, uh, stages either constrained or dependent on snow and ice habitats will be among the first to be affected by increases in atmospheric temperature. And it's very straightforward why that happens. If you're here and you, if you're in, in, the, in, the, in eastern woods and you get a five degree change in temperature, it may not mean much. If you're in a place where it's 29 degrees and you have a five degree increase, then snow and ice start melting. So you get this rapid change in any species that was either constrained or dependent on that snow and ice is going to have problems. So, like Guillemot colonies in the Western Arctic, um, there aren't uh, that many in Alaska, or at least, at least there weren't. Um, and there's, some, there's a, actually a good number, there's like tens of thousands over, over in Russia. And they were all in places where you get summer ice. And we now know, because we put geolocators on the birds on Cooper Island, that after the birds stop breeding, they only go as far south as the ice goes. They, they, they actually just, they, they, don't, they don't migrate. They, don't have, they, have, they have a facultative migration in that they're forced south by the ice formation, but it's not like basically every other species in the Arctic that heads south in late August, early September, because they're going to go someplace else. So birds are hanging out in, in, the, in the Arctic basin until late October, early November. The ice forms, and by late winter, they're down at the Bering Sea ice edge, but they are at the ice all the time, and they are moving around with the ice. So they are clearly, uh, based on even our, our, our observations and also obviously a great deal that's been done historically and ice adapted species. And this shows the sort of place that they would be uh, wintering in, basically the Bering Sea ice front um, where they can roost on the ice. We found out it's very important for them to roost. They roost for five hours a day on the ice. That's, that's actually a big part of why they want to uh, be in the ice. Uh, and then they can feed under the ice on the various prey that's there. So, the world uh, prior to my study beginning was not a warming world. Uh, it, was, it was barely warm. Uh, th this is for the 25 years before I started the study in 1975. Um, since then, from 75 to 2015, it has, things, thing, things have been warming, which means ice, ice is melting. More importantly, in terms of my location, being very close to Barrow, where there's a very good uh, weather data, is that Barrow all summer long straddles zero Celsius, or 32 Fahrenheit. And it can, it can freeze any day, 
or it can, it can melt any day. It can snow any day in Barrow. So in that sort of situation, any sort of warming is going to mean that, that, that the days above freezing are going to be much higher, and that will cause major changes. Um, and of course, these are all things I couldn't have possibly anticipated when I first started studying gill moss up there. But the mean temperature changes in Barrow have been significant. Um, um, during the rough period of my study from 77 to 2015, there's been a 5.1 uh, Fahrenheit increase. Um, and what's important to note is that overall, from the 1945 records, which is when things start, to 2015, there's, a three, there's been a 3.2 Celsius change, which is more than, the, than what everyone is fearing might happen to the world. I mean, we're, you know, we're not talking about can, 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 two, can 2C be safe. Uh, we're saying this is what we're seeing with 3.2. Uh, and it is one of the most rapidly uh, warming areas uh, in the world and also ha happens to be dominated by snow and ice habitat. So I, uh, looking at the average monthly temperature in Barrow, things were pretty stable until I started the study. Uh, but you can see what's happened since then in terms, in terms of the warming. It's been, a, it's been a steady warming since then. And luckily, there are two very good sources, actually there's three, but the two primary ones are the National Weather Service uh, station in Barrow, which has operated uh, since 1949 at a certain level, and some records go back to the earliest part of the century, and a NOAA climate monitoring lab, which is, which is monitoring um, a wide range of things and getting very good information on temperature, snow, and various things like that. So I'm able to have those data sets to tie into my natural history data set, if you like, in terms of how these, how these, how these birds are doing. So when, when, when birds get to Cooper Island in, uh, in March and April, uh, the island is snow covered. And, and the offshore area is, is ice covered. Um, in early June, things started to open up a little bit. And we didn't know in 1984, because we were told by pilots that the island was open all winter long, we didn't know when we went out there in 1984 to see the arrival of the guillemots that the island would be as snow covered as it was. Uh, we had trouble finding the island to land on it. We then set up our camp here. I had two field assistants with me, and it was only when this started to be clear that this was the south edge of the island, and we were out in Elson Lagoon, uh, and I had to go back and say, we have to move the camp. We're not on the island. Uh, <laughs> it just, it was clear why, why the birds don't, don't come back any, any, any earlier than, 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 than we did. But what we saw is that the birds actually uh, circle at some altitude, uh, maybe like 500 meters or so, and they're calling, and then they land as soon as plots of, of ground open up. Uh, and then they'll also have access to nest cavities. But clearly, it's, I mean, having been there now a number of times for arrival since 84, we can see when they arrive. So we then saw how, how the spring snow melt tied in with the, with the arrival. Four years later, we had the experience of being out on the island, measuring a breeding season, there was a light snowfall, and usually the snow, if it falls during the, during the night, will melt by noon. It was very cold in late August, 1988. We had an accumulation of like one to two inches on the island, blowing around, blowing into nest sites, and there were chicks in the nest sites that were being fed by parents. Parents came back with fish, couldn't get into the nest site, and we had these chicks losing weight rapidly. Uh, luckily, there was, a, there was a melt finally, but, but we could see the results of saying, okay, well, this, this is what happens if your summer is too short. And in terms of being too short for a guillemot, um, females don't ovulate until they get into a dark cavity, so eggs are laid 14 days after they can actually get into the cavity. Eggs are incubated for 31 days, and then the chicks grow uh, over a 35-day period. They have a tenfold increase in mass. So it takes them 80 days, a minimum of 80 days, to raise young. Uh, so they need a snow-free cavity for 80 days. Um, once we found that out, we looked at the, at the Weather Service records for Barrow from the period that the winter snow melted and when the guillemots would arrive on the island to a period of one inch, uh, or to, the, to the time of one inch of snow accumulation in the fall and plotted that for the, for, the, for, for the entire record. And what's clear is that prior to the late 1960s, it was too short of a summer to accommodate them. Um, and, uh, and the first breeding record for northern Alaska was in 1968 in the Chukchi Sea, just when this summer window was opening, when, this, when the snow-free window was opening. I found the Coop Brown colony in 72, totally unaware that this was just the first part of a climate change thing that was going on. And then we were lucky, 
uh, as such. To have this one year that said, okay, we're going to have less than 80 days. This is what happens when you have less than 80 days. And we, we could see what happens to, to chicks and nestlings when, when the parents aren't able to, to feed them uh, because of late snow, snow fall accumulation. So um, one of the things that I'm taken with, I, I've obviously been very taken with the, bird in, uh, with the bird data, but this graph by itself makes me realize that when I first went to the Arctic in the, in the, in the 1970s, that maybe you had, on average, a 90-day summer in terms of the snow-free period. It's now close to 120, which means that summer is now one month longer than it was when I first got there. Um, and it has, and actually, and this, this year may break, break the record because it still hasn't had snow in yet. So, so finding all that out, which of course took time in order to see what was going on with with the, with the, with the snowmelt, was the first real climate change uh, thing that we realized what was going on. And what, what happened as a result of that melt is that, is that you now have um, uh, guillemots breeding in ground level nests on the, on the north slope of Alaska and over into Canada in places where they didn't breed prior to the late 1960s. So it seems like the range expansion to the north was a climate change um, uh, uh, message. Now, ha having seen that birds come to the island when the snow melts, and then they lay their eggs right up against the winter. This is, this is, this is, this is winter snow that, it, that has drifted into a nest site. Birds get in there even prior to having the winter snow melt in the nest site and lay their eggs as early as possible for, and for those reasons that I showed you, because they have to get that, get, get that early start. And we've been able to uh, look at the date of the first egg in the colony um, over the past 43 years, or 42 years, and you can see what's happened. Um, is, that, is that the date uh, used to be that it was the it was the third week uh, in June uh, when they were uh, when the when the when the first egg was coming in. Now it's very getting it's getting very close to the first week in June. So we've seen this advancement, um, which is obviously part of that window opening up. But it turns out that, that this this ties into a wide range of of snow measures up there that you're very surprised about. Um, if you look at the first egg in the colony, and if you look at Barrow's snow melt uh, that's gathered at the, at, the, at the NOAA lab, they are highly correlated. Um, Bob Stone and Diane Stanitsky, who are with NOAA and who, who work with that lab, um, have found a correlation of the first egg and snow melt of Barrow of 0.78. Um, which is striking. I mean, to, to have any sort of biological response be that closely tied to a physical one is really surprising. But, and I, it, it's just recently that I've realized this is why it happens, is that essentially their snow melt that they are measuring is an albedo sensor that's looking down from a tower like this to see when things are no longer white uh, below there. And I realized when I've been on the island and the Gila Monster's circling, all they're doing is looking down and landing when things are, are no longer what. So like they are being flying albedo sensors um, that tie in very closely to what, to what is being found there. So, so this was, again, striking. And, and I mean, we have a very nice collaboration. We're going to be coming out with some, with, some, with some papers on this because it's a nice combination of a very nice long-term data set in Barrow and my Cooper Island observations. Um, but what happened last year, and I was, uh, actually what happened this past spring, which was a bit much, is that the date of snow disappearance at Barrow broke the x-axis. And I mean, I, I'm sure many of you know about Dennis Pauly shifting baseline and things like this. I, I think that basically people shouldn't accommodate climate change by changing where their, where their x-axis hits the y-axis, just so future generations can see, oh my gosh, that's where things used to be. And of course, I have a graph that shows this in a different way. But again, I mean, you can see. I mean, up until the 1990s, I could I could use the first of June, and now it's had to drop more and more. So, so we have had this past year this this record snow melt in Barrow, and it looks like a record snow accumulation. Um, so, median data collection initiation when 50% of the birds in the colony have laid eggs um, shows a rather interesting uh, pattern because this is a population response. The first egg is just an individual. And you can see here how there is this kind of tight group there and then a switch in 1990, and then a quarter century of things being rather stable. And 
this summer when I was writing a blog post, I was writing, and then for the next quarter century, and as I did, I realized, wait a minute, that is a subset of, of your data. You just said quarter century, not as, oh, by the way, I studied this for a quarter century. They don't know this is what happened for that quarter century. Mm -hmm. Um, but then what happened after that quarter century is that the median egg in 2015 broke all records, um, and then in 2016 it really broke records. So we, we, are, we are seeing these birds respond to a warming Arctic, and what may well happen soon is that birds will become disconnected from snowmelt because other factors control uh, egg laying in birds other than snow melt, and once the snow it just starts melting in early May, they're not going to lay bird, uh, eggs in early May. They'll start re uh, related to photo period, to the, to, the, to the length of the day as such up there, and to, and to, and to prey availability. And that change that took place in 1990 in median egg is well explained by the barrel temperature record that shows that there was a shift, a regime shift, uh, in 1990 um, that occurred in, in, the, in the May temperature, and the regime shift is also showing that things now in the mid-2010s are shifting up again, so we may be going into, into, into a different period. One of the things that is interesting about this, and, and I, it has been true for a number of things, is that people can't do a graphic of snow melting. So they like to have a graphic of, oh, these birds are reacting to snow melting. So, so this helps tell the climate change story, this, because clearly, clearly the physical changes are the important ones. Uh, because, of, because of what that, what that all implies. Um, but when you're talking about record climate change from the top of the world, you show a number of my banded light guillemots, rather than showing ice melt, because that's kind of like showing paint drying, I'm afraid. Um, so as that warming is taking place and opening up the season for them, um, and, and guillemots uh, were feeding Arctic cod to all of their ships. We did feeding watches from 75 on. And, Arctic cod were the only prey that was being fed, so we even stopped doing them. They feed roughly the chicks once per hour, so the prey has to be very close. And there's a, they don't go out very far like many seabirds. They'll feed within, I mean, if they can, they'll feed within five miles or even five kilometers of, of, the, of the colony. And probably 20 miles is about as far out as they would, as, as they would go, given the fact that they have to feed the chick once an hour. And, Cooper uh, Island is surrounded by ice when the birds first arrive. Uh, when, when the chicks are hatching in mid-July, it has some ice on the north side. But by late August, it's always been ice-free. Um, I mean, the ice may be offshore some distance, but, but there hasn't been any, any, any ice around it. So you have an ice-adaptive species that is living in a place where its primary habitat is disappearing during the breeding season, which is the most uh, energetically intense period of the year for them. They are feeding two chicks, they're feeding for themselves. And that ice retreat is taking place from late July throughout August um, when, they, when they're ha having to raise, raise, raise chicks. So ice retreat has occurred, um, and I mean, and of course the September ice extent, is, CS extent is something that most people are keyed into by now. Um, and you can see how Cooper Island used to be in the 70s, very close to the ice edge. Now it is some distance. And throughout the whole basin, you've had this sort of decrease from uh, roughly, from like over 7 million uh, square kilometers of ice down to 4, four to 5 uh, million in recent years. And again, my study happens to contain this period of major ice loss. If you look at the ice concentrations at Barrow, uh, it's somewhat the same story. Um, things were pretty good uh, for the first part of the study. Um, that this is just north of Barrow. Uh, you get 20 to 60 percent ice on a regular basis. But since the turn of the century, it has been frequently ice-free. And also, the sea surface temperature has increased uh, since the turn of the 20th century. So, 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 so the distance, um, distance of the ice um, and, and, the, and the SST have changed uh, rather recently. So what that means is that Arctic cod drop out at around uh, 4 degrees uh, Celsius. So starting in 2003, we started seeing them bring, bring back uh, alternate prey. The primary alternate prey they can find is the four-horned sculpin. Um, it, is a, uh, it has a rather high caloric value, but parents don't like to carry them. Chicks don't like to swallow them. That's why all of those uh, sculpin have been uh, you know, rejected in this, in this, in this nest site. And it's because they have these spines, which chicks have a tough time swallowing. And also, if they do swallow one, 
it takes them a long time to digest a very bony head, whereas cod go in just like sardines would. I mean, there's essentially nothing to it. They, just, they can like pass right through. Um, I have two videos online if you go to YouTube and there's links from my website showing parent birds trying to feed sculpin to chicks and then having the chicks not be able to eat them and, and, and in one case eating it but looking like the python that ate the pig. It's like, okay, I have this in my mouth, now what do I do? So as the sculpin were showing up, we also were seeing fish we never saw before uh, in 2003, 2004. Snailfish, a near shore demersal fish, a bottom fish, and wolf fish um, that parents, parent, parent, parents were bringing back. This bird, um, this bird happens to have a temperature depth recorder that we use to see how frequently the birds are diving and just how deep they're going. So as the ice has been retreating, there's more open air, uh, water to um, absorb sol sol solar radiation. So, so, so the sea surface temperature has increased greatly um, in northern Alaska and certainly off of, off, off of Cooper Island. And what clearly happened is that we went from an Arctic cod period prior to 2003 to a sculpin and other demersal period so that uh, things, things are not at all the same as they were for the first 27 years of the study or so. And once you realize there was this annual shift going on, we thought, okay, if we look and see what is being fed on a daily basis, get some you know, assessment of the percentage of cod and percentage of sculpin, um, and, and, can, and can take a look at that, we did that in three years. One was a very heavy ice year, 2006. One was a moderate year. And then we had 2011, which basically had the ice offshore at, at the 1st of August. And 2006, the heavy ice year, was dominated by Arctic cod, with a few sculpin coming in. Um, um, in 2007, there was a gradual decrease, and there's a very good correlation of distance to the ice with the percentage of Arctic cod over this period. So at the end of the breeding season, it was mainly sculpin. But then in 2011, when the ice really pulled offshore, <laughs> birds went to uh, sculpin on, on, on the 6th of August, and we didn't see a cod after the 6th of August, which was, again, unprecedented, because that was the primary prey for the for the for the previous, at that time, um, um, 30, 35 years or so. So what this means to guillemots that are feeding on the island, this is what the north side of the island used to look like. Uh, and they could go out and find all sorts of cod there to feed their young. Uh, breeding success was very high. And this was, this was true for around 28 years of the study. Now with the ice pulling offshore and you're getting more fetch, that the, uh, getting more open area that the that winds can operate on open water on, um, this is what it looks like on the north side. And again, those, that, that, that change for an ice-adapted species to say, okay, where do I even feed in this? I mean, where do I go? Because they certainly were using the ice as a cue saying, okay, I can dive under this ice and probably find something. They don't even really know. I mean, they are having to deal with, with, this, with this issue. And one of the things we're studying is how various individuals uh, do that, because we have individual histories, as I said. So as a result of the prey not being as available, we have seen the we have seen the alpha chick, the older chick, beat up on the beta chick. This is a this is an adult, or this is a uh, this is an alpha chick that has uh, just been fed, as you can see in the throat. This is a beta chick has been fed in a while and is driven to the back of the nest site by its sibling. And this is brood reduction. It happens in lots of birds a lot. It's a way of dealing with a prey um, availability that may not be uh, standard. And the alpha chick will grab the beta chick on the back of the head and cause a sort of chafing. And we're seeing that on a regular basis. Now, one year, all of the beta chicks die because food was so unavailable. And then after that, many of the alpha chicks died. So we had a publication that came out last year uh, that, that summarized some of this information about the, about, about the distance to the ice, looking at growth rates, of uh, fledging weights, number of chicks starved. And for the first decade of the study, it was Arctic cod and chicks could, uh, birth could raise two nestlings. For the past, um, for, for the most recent decade at that time, it was mainly sculpin, and nestlings were frequently dying. And again, you can see the, the uh, you can see the temperature going from 0.1 C, which is great Arctic cod uh, uh, temperature, to 2.4 C, which is, uh, and that increase in temperature probably is a big thing. One of the interesting things we are seeing, though, is that certain birds are going for sculpin, and certain birds are still finding cod. So being able to see that, uh, so you can look at resilience and adaptation and various things like that, um, will be very interesting to see how they, how they cope with a melting Arctic. And what's happening now is that we saw this past year, uh, we, saw, we saw capelin coming in. We hadn't seen capelin. Uh, and, and we're seeing capelin and sandlands. So they're both subarctic forage fish. So they may be moving north, and that might be the thing that happens to this colony, is that it shifts over to a real forage fish, because sculpin are not really good forage fish to raise if you're 
So seeing all that, um, um, horn, horn puffins um, are very common in the Bering Sea, but they're a subarctic species. They don't take off easily from, uh, from, wa from even from open water, and being deep in the pack ice, they could, they could be in a situation where they, where, they, where they wouldn't take off, nor are they under ice feeders. So they need large prey populations and a lot of open water. And now the, now the Arctic is apparently uh, offering some of that. They bred uh, historically as far north as Cape Lisbon in Alaska, but they colonized the Cooper Island colony in 1986. Um, and uh, this is because of the, of, the, of the sea ice extent going as far north as it was, and puffins were suddenly thinking, oh, this isn't really the Arctic anymore, it's the subarctic, so we can now breed there. They are not as handsome as black guillemots or as charismatic, but, <laughs> but, um, but they, are, they were an interesting addition, and I thought the whole colony was going to go horn puffin. I mean, that seemed to be the way things were going. Uh, puffin were going into nest sites, pushing out eggs, killing chicks, and in this case, breeding directly next to a black guillemot uh, nest uh, un under the same wooden structure. And it's a nice, if you're an ornithologist, it's a nice comparison of nest building techniques for the two species. Um, but what happened with them is the polar bear predation, because puffins are, have a 45-day nestling period, they are there until mid to the late September. They were very unsuccessful in terms of bringing off young because of the fact that polar bears were coming in, I'll get to that in a minute, so that, so that now, Puffin are not as common as they were uh, in the in the in the late 1980s and 1990s. So the big thing that happened on the island was in 2002. Uh, the ice looked like this just uh, in early August. And one of the things that's interesting about this picture is that sea ice isn't meant to look like this. Sea ice is lost, should be large, many kilometers, maybe tens, hundreds of kilometers long. This is all tiny pieces that are so 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 small they can be moved around by currents and wind which means that it's not great for a number of things. It's not great if you're a predator walking around looking for seals on it. That ice all blew offshore. We saw the first bear that we'd seen up close in 28 years uh, on 18 August 2002. The only shotgun on the island is in this tent right here. <laughs> um, so I, I and my two field systems had a short course in dealing with polar bears over the next uh, five, six days until we were rescued by search and rescue because we had a bear we couldn't back down and it took over our campsite. Um, but these are the sites that we had out there from uh, 1975 to 2011. But unfortunately, the bears uh, uh, that were starting to visit the island after, after 2002 realized that they uh, were stuck on this island. There wasn't much to eat, but there were these birds under these boards. So they started flipping them over and eating these, eat, eating these birds. And these are chicks we, were, we had been raising, we've been, we've been weighing up until then, we're going to see, okay, we get fledging success. And then you get these bears coming in and essentially eating all of your study animals. Uh, which as certain friends of mine say, gee, well, that's really an interesting climate change thing. You say, not if you're studying birds, it is. <laughs> you know, um, and so, so we saw this uh, more and more. Um, and one thing I realized after the first thing that happened in 2002 is that I couldn't live in a tent anymore. Uh, because you can't see bears coming, and also bears can just rip that very easily. So I, got, I, I took a cabin out in 2003. It's a, a, I also have a much better pantry than I had uh, back then. So it is a secure place that I can sleep at night and hope that bears don't come in. And I had a camera set up in 2008 at one of the nest sites and, uh, at a, and, and happened to catch this bear poking around the back of the cabin. So it's like, okay, so maybe we need a little bit more than that because I could have just opened the door and encountered that bear. So we now have an electric fence. <laughs> so I now live behind an electric fence in a wooden box because of polar bear predation. And it wasn't until 2011, uh, and I hate to admit this. Oh, and this is, this is I don't want to show you this whole thing, but this is kind of what happens is that if the bear can't eat the chicks and, and, is, and is coming up to your, to your campsite, um, it will start eating vegetation. And this is what the polar bears mainly eat on the island now, um, is vegetation. Uh, we know this because of finding their feces. Um, there is nothing else to eat. Um, it is very sad when you see a mother, a, a, a female bear, a sow with young, and, she, and she's lactating, and she's meant to be eating seal blubber, and, she's, and she is eating vegetation like this. This is a young male who, who, male, who may well have made it through that period uh, on the island, but certainly young cubs that are there with their mothers uh, almost certainly don't. But in 2009, uh, we had 184 guillemots hatch. Uh, 90 were killed or eaten by polar bears. It's like flipping over sites like I showed. 81 were killed by puffins going to the nest sites. So it was a 
it was a subarctic uh, nest competitor coming north and a nest predator coming south on the Cooper Island, and then 12 died of other causes, which might have included boredom, that you get down to having one chick fledge out of that whole thing. And I thought, okay, this study's over. I'll go out, I'll still get dates of egg laying, because nothing's going on until August. I'll still get the first part of the season. And then someone said, couldn't you maybe build a nest site that doesn't allow polar bears to get in? So I was packing my pelican cases to go to the field, and I thought, okay, if, if, I, if I get this watertight pelican case, drill a hole in the end of it, uh, and, put it and put in a baffle, it, it might just work. And so in 2010, we uh, rather, uh, yeah, in 2010, we then tried this. Now, this bear had just eaten a whole bunch of other chicks, and it was sure it could, it could get in there because it had just gone to a number of wooden sites, but it couldn't get into this plastic case. So we wanted to keep studying black guillemots because they were the canary in the coal mine. And we wanted to know when things got really bad in the coal mine. And now, now the bears can't get in uh, because, and, 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 they, and they just also just walk right by. And we've also put out puffin cases too because we didn't want them to feel left out. We have larger cases for the puffins. But, um, but uh, basically now, now now, now the whole island um, has 200 nest cases on it, 200 black nest cases. So when you fly over, it looks like a Samsonite luggage truck exploded on it somewhere. <laughs> so as all that was going on and, and the population grew, um, one of the things that happened is that I stopped building nest sites in, uh, in the late uh, 80s uh, because I was out there by my own, on, on my own. I couldn't handle more than 200 nest sites, and Ronald Reagan had cut my funding. And so so like I then said, I said, okay, we're, we're, we're going to stop at 200. Uh, and the Guillemots didn't know I was stopping at 200, so they kept coming in looking. So like this, this shows uh, a pair at one, one of the wooden sites there. This is a pair that owns this log, which is not a nest site. This is a pair, this is a beta pair that is playing that, that site and also one to the right. And this is, a, this is another beta pair. So there were, there were like all these non-breeders that were coming in uh, during that period. I mean, there were like more Guillemots in the world than I could even accommodate at Cooper at, at that point. But then, it, after 1990, as part of that warming I showed you when the, when the median age date changed, things started to go downhill. Now, we are analyzing the data with some very good French uh, demographic people right now to actually see what the main causes were um, for, this, for this decline. Having a decrease in immigration seems to be part of it. Um, Herald Island, which is a large colony of probably 20,000 uh, black guillemots with 1,000-foot cliffs, uh, due west of Cooper is probably the source for most of the birds that have come into Cooper. Um, and, and, and it turns out it is having the same problems with ice concentration as Cooper Island has. So basically, it, it is no longer a great place to be a black guillemot trying, trying, trying to raise young. So they're, they're not producing enough young to throw off immigrants that can then come to Cooper. And immigration played a large role in being able to maintain that. So even though I'm studying the birds on just this one island, it looks like in terms of the, at least the Western Arctic Basin, um, there, is, there has been a basin-wide shift from what was happening in the 1980s when birds were right up against the ice to currently when black guillemots don't really have the ice to work with. So again, this is a rough uh, thing. We'll have a much better view in a few months about what's going on here. But you can see how the downward population trend to, to, to currently 100 pairs, down from 200, uh, parallels the, the, the ice decrease over that, over, over that same time period. And this is the picture of the, uh, of the, uh, of this, this is the aerial shot. You, you can barely see uh, in some of these that you have little black cases here because now everyone is reading in one of those black cases. Um, one of the things, this gets to be depressing to go out there and see all this. To see, well, they like, how do you stay, you know, how do you keep, because I'm out there for 12, 13 weeks. Because I have all the birds banded, I know who they're breeding with, okay? And what has happened as the colony has declined, if, if you look on the on the on the on the right hand side, that male disappearing means okay, that is a male that didn't survive the winter. And what we're seeing for the first time is females come back to, to their nest site occupied the previous year, and they don't have a mate. And there aren't a bunch of mates around. So th then you have the widow next door occupying a nest case on her own, which never which like never happened in the past. As it turns out, the the male who is on the adjacent nest site, who might be, you know, twenty even up to 20, 30, 40 meters away. When his female is offshore making the egg, we'll go over and keep company with the widow next door. Um, and we have seen this happen in around 5% of all the nests um, uh, since, oh, since probably 2002 or so. 
And typically, then the male goes back and then is with his female. But in some cases, the female who he went over to keep company with lays eggs, and he will go over there and incubate. This two, two years ago, in 2015, we actually had a bird that kept company so much with the widow next door that he fed the chicks and also incubated the eggs and raised four young. So we saw the first instance of polygamy. Uh, and I, of course, ornithologists think this is very interesting compared to the world melting from the top down. Um, and so, I mean, it brings up, it, it brings up the question, um, it's like, who would care who's dating who during a, dur during a major disaster? I mean, if this is going to go on from 1885 to 2085, what's going to happen with sea ice? Who would care if yellow, blue, yellow, green, blue is breeding with white, red, white or not? Um, and like, would the American public actually be interested in who's dating who when a major disaster is taking place? And as I was giving a talk and posing that question, I realized the major disaster, one of the major disasters in the 20th century was the sinking of the Titanic. And when it was presented to the American public, it was presented as an issue of who's dating who. So it's like, it's like okay, yes, people are more interested in kind of gossip like that than the bigger picture. Uh, but again, when I'm out there on the island alone and I'm able to track these individuals like that, uh, it really sustains me. So there are some other warming effects. We had a major storm in 2000 with 85 mile per hour winds, uh, which very uncommon uh, wind up there that caused one third of all like a month chicks to starve because no one was flying in the temperature. Also, the island is melting. The island itself used to be permafrost. We used to have a frost cellar. I would dig a hole every year and put yogurt, cheese. I went out there in 2004, started digging the hole went around a meter and a half deep and hit water. And that was at a place where I knew I had hit ice in previous years. So, so the island itself is melting, it's eroding into the sea, and the island itself could go uh, underwater. That, I mean, even prior to the guillemots getting down to, to a very small number. And this is one of the classic shots uh, you see of uh, coastal erosion in Arctic Alaska, but it is due south of Cooper Island, where you get this major uh, change taking place. So, what the response has been to a warming uh, Arctic of the Bikilomot, there was a range expansion in the 60s and early 70s, and then there was a short period. It was the Gilmot salad days from 1970 to 89 when the ice was close enough and the summer was long enough and everything was fine. Um, but then there was this earlier breeding starting in 1990 with this Arctic oscillation shift that warmed things up, and the population started to decline because people measuring ice also date things back to that 8990 uh, switch of the Arctic oscillation. And then in the early 2000s, as the ice was further offshore, the sea surface temperature became higher, uh, and the sea ice was well offshore, so there was a decrease in the primary prey of Arctic cod. Uh, and there was a southern movement of a nest predator in, in the polar bear, and a northward movement of a nest competitor in, in the horned puffin, which, uh, if we had not put out the nest cases, obviously both of those effects would have, would have, would have wiped out the colony. And there's a continuing population decline in the 2010s as sea ice continues, and it is a thing, I mean, given the fact that we did do, we did put out all those nest sites, it's, yes, guillemots are still breeding in the Arctic, but they are now breeding in bunkers to have to do so. So the only good news in the, in the adult survival, and we have mostly adults banded, has not changed through time. So, so that the winter situation, which is when all the mortality occurs for adults from September through April, um, hasn't, hasn't shown any trends. So the so changes in sea ice aren't really impacting adults, and that is the only good news. But one of the things that, again, is very striking and, uh, is that during the period of my study, this is what's happened to uh, observed and predicted sea ice extent. Um, when I talked to my donors and other people, um, I mentioned that if, if we, and someone other than me in the very distant future, can keep it going, we could actually measure this population as sea ice totally disappears from the Arctic Basin. And given the fact that we have 42 years in this far, I mean, you're in, in for 42 years, you might as well do another 42. Um, and the Arctic could be, uh, could be ice free, and how an ice adapted Pleistocene relic seabird will deal with that um, poses all sorts of questions. I, a little bit longer, or a little bit. I, I just want to say that in terms of outreach, we've been. I've been very surprised. I was on the cover of the New York Times Magazine in 2002. It um, uh, was a very nice piece written by Darcy Frey about the about the melt in Barrow and and the Cooper Island study and the Arctic, which led to an led to an appearance on David Letterman, 
which led to IBM ThinkPad saying, could you, if we give you a ThinkPad and you use it for a month, could, could we use it, use you in an ad? So we went to Barrow, took this great April sunrise shot, and I said, you can use it if you put this in, which is on ice that may not be here in 100 years, which for, which for 2002 was, was, I was very impressed that the advertising firm did that. And now James Maslanik, who helped me, I said, hey, Jim, it's okay for you. He's an ice person. He said, it's, it's okay. And now we realize we could have said 50 years. But, and then it turns out that the, uh, that, that the Royal National Theatre in London, when they wanted to do a climate change play, uh, had somebody who found all the Coop Brown stuff online, wrote a play, and I had the actor playing me call me up, or rather email me and say, I'm playing you in a play. Can I talk to you about what it's really like on the island? In a play called Greenland, they had this person, who's meant to be the younger me, thinking about going out to Cooper, and this is the older and younger me. On, and Gil, and Gilmots were being projected around the Royal National Theater, and Gilmots calls were being played, and I'm sitting there, jet lagged, and I'm from, from Seattle, thinking, is this the acid flashback that Tom <laughs> in the 70s? And what I love is that they had to put fake Gilmot poop on it, because if you look at pictures of me online, I have Gilmot poop all over me, of course, because I'm hands with that many chicks. So they had, and Michael Gould and uh, David, David Swan, two people in the picture, are very nice. And they had a polar bear, which I didn't realize until the second view, uh, viewing kills me, or kills, kills the Gilmot researcher at the end of the play. Oh. So uh, we also have a very nice educational art reach, which was uh, expedited by, certainly by, 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 by Kosi and, um, and, and, and Arcus, uh, where kids run out, get Arctic cod under these pieces of ice and run back, and then you keep moving the ice further out, and, 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 they, and they tally it, and then you say, okay, this is how far the ice, and then they realize, it's like, okay, yeah, if I was feeding my young, that. So we have a nonprofit, Friends of Cooper Island. Um, we operate on the view that we are too small to fail, uh, because if, if we don't get funding one year, uh, we have to go up anyway. So, um, uh, and, and keeping a free uh, study going, you have to keep costs as minimum. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do a great deal in the next eight years, because we want to hit 50 years, and the next eight years in the Arctic are going to be critical, and we are looking to expand our outreach and collaboration. Anyone who happens to see this or is interested in that, please contact me, because we need, we need friends because we want to keep it going. Uh, we want to keep it going, and my board keeps saying, what if you get hit by a truck tomorrow? Mm -hmm. They're not concerned about the polar bears. <laughs> it's the truck. So in the middle of that, just in the, most, in the, well, in the past two weeks, somebody found a major oil discovery um, 40 miles east of Cooper Island. So this is the reason why you can't uh, stop the study now. Uh, uh, fossil fuels first took me up there because of the because of the Prudhoe Bay thing. Uh, fossil fuels got me back because of the other kind of shelf. Um, fossil fuel emissions kept, kept me going for the past 20 years because of the warming. And now uh, fossil fuel exploitation may again be a major role in terms of in terms of what's going on. So the take-home message is that the Western Arctic went from being too cold to being too warm to support ground nesting by guillemots in 50 years. And the subtext is that I happen to be there for that whole period. So. Um, and I'd like to thank the Nupiat people in Barrow who have, who have made this all possible. Uh, because I fly to Barrow, and <laughs> I'm a suburban guy from Cleveland, and they, they, they are amazed that nothing's happened to me out there, but their support, um, their moral and, and other support has just been incredibly important. And I realize they are living in the Arctic. They are, the, they, they are dealing with, with all these changes, and it isn't some abstract thing where a Gilliamot colony that someone created is being impacted. They are living in a town that's been there for a very, very long time and having these, having these real changes take place. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, the North Slope Borough Wildlife Management Department that helps greatly, the residents of Barrow, um, and the contributors to Friends of Cooper Island. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, George. Uh, maybe we have time for some questions. I, I think we can probably keep people a little bit. If you have to go, you have to go. But um, anybody in the room have any questions? Yes, uh, Ray. Yeah, I, a question about the uh, polar bear invasion, if I'm the right word, but what was the reason that they, I assume, was their loss, the loss of sea ice that drove them onto Cooper Island? Yes. And, um, and actually, with the real polar bear biology, the thing is, it turns out, I didn't know it, but I have a polar bear data set, you know, because I didn't have them for X number of years, and so now I do. And that data is being integrated with the real polar bear biologists who are looking at this. I did a rough analysis once where when the ice pulls off the shelf, off the continental shelf north of Cooper, that is a, those are the years when the bears come south. Um, because, I mean, because ice is clearly there you know, all the time, and it's only when the ice is so far offshore, and if seal densities actually do drop when 
the ice is off the shelf, as people say they do, then it's like, okay, certain bears abandon the ice and swim in. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, it, I mean, it, it ties in, and I mean, and, and, and I have graphs which I didn't show today that shows this shows this annual ice condition, say for 15 August, and the and the uh, and the occurrence of polar bears. Great. So I have a couple of questions online here. Uh, first one from uh, Betsy Turner Gogren asks, uh, um, Have you seen any changes in uh, egg production from uh, nesting pairs? Um, no. I mean, one of the downsides of gillamots is that unlike most most seabirds only lay one egg. Um, uh, gillamots lay two. But they almost always lay two, and there's been no change yet to drop down to one. And that is basically because when the female is forming the egg um, in early June, the ice is right there, and there's a great deal of Arctic cock. So there's no major uh, stressor that would have her say, I can't lay a two-way clutch this year. I have to go with one. And people have seen in pigeon guillemots uh, on the coast of Oregon during uh, severe El, El, El Nino years that females will drop down to one egg. Uh, but we, we've seen nothing yet. But again, things will have to get very bad to have prey in June and, and July uh, affect anything. A uh, question from uh, Astrid Zermatt uh, asks about, uh, do you remove the nesting cases after the season or do you leave them there? No, we, uh, we leave them there uh, for a number of reasons. We don't know uh, when we'll be able to get out uh, if something were to happen. In the past, we would always go out by snow machine. Now, with the ice melting, we have a tougher time getting out there. So, no, we leave them there. We, uh, we, 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 we clean them up at the end of the season and make sure everything's okay. But, no, they're there all year. What's in the room? Yeah. George, sorry, I, I may have missed the beginning. But other than where you've created these nesting cavities, what are the nesting structures or cavities that the birds are using? Elsewhere in the Arctic. Oh, well, down in Cape Lisbon, the closest colony, or at Harold Island, it's uh, rock rubble at the base of a cliff, scree, talus, various things. But they are so plastic that they will find, I mean, any sort of, even in a, in a high cliff, there's an opening there that they can get into, they will, they will, they, they will be there. They're, they're, they're very much, and, and, and the genus is known to be a general species. They breed under docks up and down the west coast, uh, pigeon, pigeon, pigeon guillemots do, uh, black guillemots in Great Britain and Scotland breed under docks things like that, anything that has a cover on it. So, I'm sorry, just as a follow-up. So, as the ice is melting, there is potential for more nesting habitat, but then, is, and, and I guess I'm asking this as a question, is there more potential for more nesting habitat in other places, but then you, you get the play that there would be foraging habitat in, in those? Well, I mean, the Canadian Arctic, because it goes so high and has so many good coastlines, and it would be an excellent place to examine that, but no one is censusing um, guillemots or, or any other seabird there on a regular basis. I would assume, I mean, one of the problems with Barrow, Alaska, is it, it's Barrow and then the North Pole. Uh, I mean, it's a problem, but that's just how it is. Uh, so that there is no further place north you can go, but I would assume that in Canada, uh, birds are being able to move north in in the places that used to be either too snow covered or even too icy to support breeding, and they can breed there for a while. Um, but you know, it, this is kind of the same thing, I suppose, with the last ice with the polar bear. They have that one area that's just west of the Canadian archipelago. They think where polar bears may persist. That could be where black guillemots persist, though they're so adaptable that they also could basically, you know, I mean, we're, we are having a selection event go on. Is that they is that they will become a subarctic seabird. So um, you, you mentioned a lot about the people living in Barrow, and the question I have here is, uh, uh, were the local people um, interested in this research, and do you have a lot of uh, dialogue with them about the things that you're finding out? Uh, y yes, they are very interested, and they uh, and I have a great deal of dialogue, uh, certainly with the North Slope Bird Wildlife Management Department that, that, that helps me out in, in many, many ways. But even, I mean, one of the things that happened is that when the Outer Continental Shelf funding ended in 1981, because around... Reagan. Um, I went back in 82 because I had birds that were six years old that I had banded as chicks. I thought I have to look at them because they're six, you know, I didn't realize I'd be keeping with them until they were 30. And when I got there, uh, and pe people have told me this in town, is that they realized I wasn't there just because NSF or somebody else was funding research. I liked the Arctic. I was connected to the Arctic, and I wanted to come back. And that meant a huge amount to them because they had seen so many people for years come in, use it as a laboratory, and it's basically, okay, we're here, we're going to get our research, and then we're going to go back. And, and no, I, it, was, it was both a connection with certainly with the data, with the Arctic, and with the people. Great, great. Yeah, at Washburn EPA. 
the, uh, there's a program in, in Alaska called LEO, the Local Environmental Observer. It's run out of the oh, yeah, yeah. Alaska Native uh -huh. Tribal Health Consortium. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if your data, uh, if you use some of that data, and that's where local citizens are making observations and posting them on the map there. You know, actually, I mean, I mean, I hate to say it, but I mean, I certainly know of the program. I haven't looked at it. One of the things about about being in Barrow is that the Wildlife Management Department does so much, and they involve uh, some so so many people in the native community um, that um, that they, I mean, that they're the people who are really, really gathering the data sets and, and seal and bowhead whale and other observation writers that I that I that I tie into. But no, no, I haven't looked at Leo in that way. Okay, maybe one last question. Does anybody have online in the room now? Yeah. So just if, if you can play this scenario forward, you know, one, two, four decades. I mean, I, I know it's, it's a depressing thing to think about potentially for, for Cooper Island, but, um, you know, what you see with, with this colony and what you see with the, the larger, I mean, you, you talked a little bit about the potential um, of the, the species becoming more subarctic. Well, you could just play that for I mean, uh, last summer we had a big storm surge that covered half of the island. All of the boxes that I found there originally in 55 were the place that was on high ground, high ground being two meters above sea level. So, so, that, so that none of the nests or very, very, very few of the nest sites were impacted. But all it would take is the ice to be well offshore with this, with this north side of the island eroding the way it is. Um, and then if it starts, I mean, that could happen next year. I mean, we actually had to buy, we didn't have to, but we bought um, full body survival suits because we realized we're in this cabin, but we, and we don't think it's going to go underwater, but it could. Um, and and I, I mean, what I was thinking about having been at the Smithsonian in 1970, I thought, what if someone were to come in when I was there in 1970 and had spent 40 years in the Arctic and was talking to me about things from 1930 to the present? And then what if someone now, and of course no one will go out and do this sort of study now, start a study now, you know, I mean, people can't even think past 2050 in terms of how things are going to be. Because it's like, you know, I mean, because basically the ice, the ice, the, the ice will be gone. Um, I guess because, because we don't know, um, it, it, it's all the more reason to study it. I do think that because it's such an adaptable species, they will adapt to new prey sources. That is the question, will the island they're on persist? Um, but again, being able to look at selection in a situation like that, when what will be going on in the rest of the world will be so big, um, you know, it, it, it isn't something that's going to engage me greatly. That, oh my God, it's great that I'm able to see this event when, when like the big events are actually not that great. Okay, well, thank you very much for a wonderful portrait of what's going on. What's going on with the uh, Arctic? What's going on with the birds? So just a, what an amazing way to connect everything together. Thanks so much. So I just wanted to conclude with a couple of quick remarks about upcoming events. Um, please note that these uh, seminars are recorded and you're uh, welcome to view them on our website. Um, again, we'd invite you all to become members of ARCUS uh, individually and with your organizations and there's a link to do that. Um, invite everyone who might be going to the American Geophysical Union meeting in San Francisco in December to come to the Arctic Community Reception and uh, we're also having our annual meeting. Of, uh, of members and anybody who wants to can attend that. Um, so uh, you're invited to that and you can get the information. Um, if you are interested in holding any kind of a meeting, whether it's uh, Arcus related or not, that has to do with the Arctic at the AGU fall meeting, you're invited to uh, um, sign up to uh, use some of the space. We provide, uh, uh, with generous support from the National Science Foundation, we provide um, several rooms for people to meet in at the uh, at the AGU, and you're welcome to use that for Arctic-related activities. Um, and, and finally, I wanted to put in a plug for an event that's happening tomorrow, if you happen to be here in D.C. in particular, that the uh, Fulbright Arctic Symposium is taking place uh, um, all day tomorrow, and I encourage you, if you're interested in Arctic issues, this is going to be a very wide-ranging uh, uh, symposium and a lot of interesting topics related to Arctic research. And uh, again, thank you so much for coming out for today's uh, seminar and um, look forward to uh, talking with you all next time. Thanks.